Welcome to another edition of Who's Number One. I'm Trey Winko. Let's face it, fight night, electric. Unlike any other night in sports, you can smell bloodlust in the air, the adrenaline, the anticipation, the sweat. And if you're lucky, it lives up to all the hype and reminds us why boxing is indeed called the sweet science. Look, there have been thousands of forgettable fights, but a handful, a <laughs> handful of great ones. To that end, ESPN Classic has ranked the 20 best fights of all time. 20. On September 22, 1927, Chicago's Soldier Field was overflowing with more than 100,000 fans for the rematch between heavyweight champ Gene Tunney and the man whose title he had taken, the legendary Jack Dempsey. Special trains coming from both coasts, day and night, in the days leading up to the fight, Irving Berlin, George M. Cohan, and everybody else that had a name in America was sitting 10 or 15 rows back at that fight. Tunney was at his peak. Tunney had been doing a lot of fighting. He was ready. He was in fine shape. He was tuned, and he wasn't afraid. Tunney was a very brave man. He knew what he was doing in the ring. Dempsey was a tremendous puncher, tremendous finisher, good hand speed, too. Tunney is down from the referee kept waving at him to move over, and when he finally did, time on the timekeeper's clock was five seconds. The rules had been changed before this bout, requiring the man who scored the knockdown to retreat to a neutral corner. Before that, a fighter could remain coiled and ready to pounce. You could stand right over him, you know, like a street fight, waiting for him to get up. Dempsey didn't become the Manasseh Mahler for being a genteel guy in the boxing ring. Once he dropped Tony, I just think he completely forgot. Instead of starting on six, he started on one, two. I've seen that movie hundreds of times. He was knocked out. If you've ever been knocked out, you can come out of it like that. And it was four seconds that he needed to come out of it. A resilient Tunney recuperated between rounds and then boxed his way to another 10-round unanimous decision. Mata was the first guy to beat Ray Robinson, and, and uh, you know, Ray Robinson never forgave him. Obviously, he just kept beating him up after that. On February 14, 1951, in Chicago, in a middleweight title fight that became known as Boxing St. Valentine's Day Massacre, old adversary Sugar Ray Robinson and Jake LaMotta fought for the sixth and final time. Robinson won for the fifth time, but he still couldn't knock down the defiant raging bull. Robinson knew that LaMotta was having trouble making weight, and his strategy going into the fight was to make LaMotta work, to tire himself out in the early rounds. Every time the referee breaks him, he backs off so far that Jake has to waddle after him. All he's going to do is take the legs out from under Jake. By the 10th round, LaMotta was out of gas. LaMotta makes a last desperate stand. He bowls. Robinson into a corner, he throws everything he's got at Robinson. And then Robinson comes out of the corner blazing, and the fight turns right there. He threw a left hook, a right hand, left hook. That so fast that it was like one punch. No man can enjoy that punch. Ray was unleashing everything on him. Lamar at this moment, a tired battler, a chopping block. The referee stopped the fight in the 13th round while I was still on my feet with Robinson pounding me up against the ropes. If the referee held up another 30 seconds, Robinson would have collapsed from hitting me. Jake never went down, and he was very proud of that. Jake Lamotta was against the ropes. I mean, if you see Jake, he's like this, and he's like that in the ropes. I mean, he was beat up. And that's why that's one of my favorite scenes from the movie Raging Boys. Like, come put me down, Ray. He could not be down. You need a great storyline to start with to have a great fight in the end. George Foreman was a bully and a villain. He was also heavyweight champ when he faced 7-1 to one underdog Muhammad Ali in Kinshasa Zaire on October 30th, 1974, in a fight that went down as the rumble in the jungle. We got off the plane. They were saying, Ali Boumaye, Ali kill him. Ali's greatest hour. First round, Ali goes up on his toe. Bang! Hits him with that first shot. Now, what does Foreman do? Cuts the ring off. Ali goes back on the ropes. The whole time we were there, all we did was had sparring partners pressuring him to the rope so he could spin this way, spin that way. I hit him hard in the side. I mean, I got a good shot. And he said, is that all you got, George? 
And I remember thinking, yep, that's about it. It was a huge, brilliant gamble, but one that could have backfired on him very easily. When Ali knocked him down and knocked him out, he said it was the hardest he had ever been hit. 17, 17. Most important sporting event of the 20th century by far. Even non-sports fans were glued to the radio. On June 22nd, 1938, two years after Germany's Max Schmeling had scored a 12th round knockout of Joe Lewis, more than 70,000 crammed into Yankee Stadium for the rematch. It was a fight for Lewis's heavyweight championship and for so much more. No fighter, in my opinion, has ever had the pressure that those two guys had on them that night because it was not a boxing match. It was a fight about the two ways the world was going to go. Lewis measured him right to the body, a left hook to the jaw, and Schmeling is down. It's not like Lewis won in a great back and forth action fight and found redemption. It's that. No, I understand you have your theories about Aryan supremacy, but let's talk about American supremacy. Black, white, whatever. It was the good guys. I'm not saying Schmeling was a bad guy, but he clearly represented the bad guys. Not just the bad guys, but the worst who ever lived. He's going in to fight a guy who not who destroyed him when they for the first time they fought. It was Joe Lewis's greatest, greatest hour. No fighter could have rushed at his play faster than Joe Lewis, one after the unfortunate Max Schmeling. The mismatch ended after just two minutes, four seconds of the first round. He gave that German such a shellacking. Put him in a hospital for a week. 16-16-16. Four blood-spattered times the two Tigers fought each other, Willie Pep and Sandy Sadler, for the featherweight title. Their most memorable was number two on February 11th, 1949 in Madison Square Garden. Brutal as usual, and Pep's only win in the series, a unanimous 15-round decision. If you want to take a kid and teach him uh, how to violate every rule of boxing, you want to watch the second Pep's saddle fight, how they, you know, they need each other, and they hit low, and they hit high. It was the greatest piece of boxing I've ever seen on the part of Willie Pep, who was fighting a man, Sandy Sadler, who was very dirty, and he knew all the tricks. And not only was he fighting him and boxing him and outboxing him and doing all his beautiful tricks, he was an artist in the ring, but he was doing it with one eye closed. Sadler was a freak in the featherweight division. You know, just a huge guy and a huge puncher. Really, the wisp, you know, he really couldn't break an egg, but, he could box your ears off, and uh, he really knew how to be the boss in that ring. He really used every inch of that ring when he had to. A fight that should go down in history, something we should pay attention to. When it comes to who's number... sorry for his opponent not that his opponent was necessarily going to lose but he would find out about you. you you he was going to take you to hell on november 13th 1992 in las vegas riddick bow and evander holyfield each undefeated descended into fistic hades to determine the heavyweight title bow the nine to five underdog decked the champ in the 11th while pounding out a one-sided 12 round unanimous decision riddick bow was a terrific boxer Big man, great boxing skill. Here were two really tough guys. Bo had Holyfield reeling across the ring, going back and forth. Holyfield was out on his feet. And then Bo got tired, and Holyfield came back and started throwing hooks and uppercuts and go, and bam, bam, bam. Riddick Bo, we knew he was a good specimen, a new prototypical heavyweight, the great Eddie Fudge with him. A lot of people didn't think he had the most important thing, the heart, to overcome a tough fight. And who's he fighting? A warrior. What did he do right in front of you? He became all the things that people thought maybe he could be if he was really going to put it together and be that man. They brought the dog out in each other, and they came to just do their business. For the winner by a unanimous decision and new heavyweight champion of the world, Riddick Bowe! Four, 
Sugar Ray Leonard could dance on the ceiling. Thomas Hearns punched like thunder. On September 16, 1981, in Las Vegas, they met to unify the welterweight title. It was billed as Super Fight, and it was. I didn't think my brother could beat no Tommy Hearns. 6'1", long reach. I was very shocked because I never saw him hurt. Instead of the hitman, then Thomas Hearns became the boxer, and Ray Leonard became the hunter. Hearns in trouble, no question about it, and Sugar senses it. Hearns wasn't beating people. He was knocking them half dead, senseless. Bang, and guys are falling like trees. So as a little kid, I remember feeling scared for Ray Leonard going in, because you identify. You're in the ring with Tommy Hearns. He's six foot two. 78 inch reach, not much shorter than Larry Holmes' reach or Muhammad Ali's reach. He's a welterweight. He can hit you from across the ring. Tommy's Hearns' chin wasn't as good as Leonard. And so Tommy was outside, pa, 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 throwing your right hand, just tagging Leonard, tagging Leonard, tagging Leonard. Tommy Hearns was a bang, bang, you know? You still kept your chin in front of him, you were in tr deep trouble. The quickness of Ray overcame the strength of Hearns. Because Hearns had, it was a whacker, a good whacker. Trailing after 12 rounds, Leonard knocked down Hearns twice in the 13th and finished him off in the next round. That's it. Check out Ray Leonard has won by a technical knockout. 13-13. On September 23rd, 1952, in Philadelphia, unbeaten Rocky Marciano went after the heavyweight title of Jersey Joe Walker, who was told at every turn that he had no chance. Rock would take two to throw one, and he always counted on his power. He always had faith in his power, and his, and his power prevailed. Marciano couldn't lay a glove on Jersey Joe Walcott because of Jersey Joe's artistic ring talent. Two of them came out making moves, and all of a sudden, Walcott threw that hook, and down went the Rocky on his hands and knees. Down from a left hook. A lot of fighters, when they get knocked down and cut the first time, fall apart emotionally. Marciano got tougher. Because I was talking to Rocky after the fight, and I says, uh, could you see the guy at all, Rock? He says, snap for three or four rounds. All I could see was a shadow. In the 12th round, Walcott gave Marciano such a beating that I didn't think Rocky would be able to come out for the 13th round. Marciano was behind on all three scorecards. He maneuvered Walcott to the ropes in the 13th round. I was hollering, Lollapalooza, Rock, Lollapalooza, and then all of a sudden, bang. He fell flat in his face, thought it killed him. People in the audience were just amazed. Marciano had his own little genius that I think made him special. He started the left hand, just started just to take the eye of Walcott off his right hand. Just started, bam, and he shot the right hand, and he nailed a great fighter, Walcott, when he had to with that power, with that Susie Q. Larry Holmes and WBC champ Ken Norton were regarded as something of lightweights when on June 9, 1978 in Las Vegas, they met for the heavyweight title. They delivered a fearsome 15-round performance that enhanced the reputations of both and was decided by a split decision. You didn't know who won it at the end. It was fierce. This was the first time we got a chance to see how tough Larry Holmes was. They could have fought the last round. Two exhausted guys who had given everything in a, in a phone booth, and there'd have been no glass left in that booth, I'll tell you that much. I mean, those guys were, were really fighting. That's a great fight. Unfortunately, people sometimes do not give it the respect and the attention that it deserves and that those two fighters deserve because of what they put into that fight. First of all, one of the last 15 round fights. Both guys knew that what that 15th round was gonna represent. They understood it came down to that and they gave everything. Larry Holmes had to win the last round to win the fight, and actually Norton won the last round, and Holmes just won the last 15 seconds, and they gave it to Holmes, which gave him the title. 11-11. On January 24th, 1976, after losing the Rumble in the Jungle 15 months earlier, George Foreman returned to the ring in Las Vegas. He brought his sledgehammer fist with him. So did his opponent, Ron Lyle. Two locomotives collided head-on. Foreman was knocked down twice, 
but hammered out a fifth round KO. It's one thing to see a guy go down, get up and fight on. It's another thing to see a guy go down, get up and fight on and win. When you were a kid, yo-yo was your toy. You want to see this fight down, up, down, up. Ron Lyle was this chiseled, tough guy. George Foreman's a monster. Six foot four. You know, at the time, then he was like 225, pure muscle ripped. It was two lumberjacks just, you know, chopping each other down. It hurt to watch. Lyle was a here-I-am fighter. George was a here-I-am fighter. They could have held the thing in a phone booth. That's all the room they needed. I would say that George was a mauler. He depended on his brute strength uh, with both hands to take his opponent down as, as fast as he could. Both fighters, Foreman and Lyle, were on the deck in that fight in a way that made you think, the fight's over. I remember it being called the yellow fader fight because they were up and down. I mean, they were just up and down so much, both guys. It's sit back. Welcome back to Who's Number One. In this edition, we're counting down the 20 greatest fights of all time. Before we get to the final 10, here's the list so far. 20. Gene Tunney, Jack Dempsey, the long count. 19. Sugar Ray Robinson, Jake LaMotta, number six. Eight. Muhammad Ali, George Foreman, Rumble in the Jungle. 17. Joe Lewis, Max Schmeling, more than a fight. 16. Willie Pep, Sandy Sadler, number two of four. Fifteen. Evander Holyfield, Riddick Bowe, Battle of the Unbeatens. Fourteen. Sugar Ray Leonard, Thomas Hearns, Big Rally. Thirteen. Rocky Marciano, Jersey Joe Walker, One Big Punch. Twelve. Larry Holmes, Ken Norton, Iowa. Eleven. George Foreman, Ron Lyle, Timber. And now we resume our countdown of the best smackdowns. Number 10 on the list. 10, 10, 10. I remember watching it on tape and just thinking, oh my God, it's an all time beatdown by both fighters. Carmen Basilio could take a punch. Boy, could he take a punch. On June 10th, 1955, Basilio took scores of punches from welterweight champ Tony DeMarco. In the 10th round, Basilio began to give what he had been receiving, scoring two knockdowns and then a 12th round TKO. To beat Carl Basilio, you had to hit him with a plank. This guy, <laughs> this guy was great. DeMarco, he had one advantage physically over Basilio. He could punch like hell. Tony DeMarco hit me in the chin. The only guy that ever staggered me. He hit me in the chin with a left hook that I saw coming from a mile away, and I never made an attempt to put my hand up to block it or anything. He, and I staggered like a drunk man for a few seconds. Somehow he just stopped. His backside was like inches from the freaking back, and he just stopped like he was sitting in a chair. And he just refused to allow himself to go where gravity was taking him. And that was the turning point of the fight because the Marco had hit him his Sunday punch. You know how your foot goes sleeve, you got the little pins and needles? Well, they were this long. And the bottom of the foot, and I, the whole 60-second rest, I just kept stamping my leg to bring it back. Basilio was a guy that, boy, they should put his face next to tough. He was a little underrated as far as being clever. He'd roll his head, do things like that. Boy, what a shit he had. I think mentally, not just physically, mentally, that somehow started to evaporate some things that were inside the head of Tony DeMarco. Left and right to the jaw, and the referee steps in and stops the fight. DeMarco is out. Nine, nine, nine. Alexis Arguello had methodically mowed his way through one division after another. On November 12, 1982, in Miami's Orange Bowl, he found Aaron Pryor, the WBA junior welterweight champ, standing between him and history. Arguello's won three weight class championships, and he's moving up for a fourth. And had Aaron Pryor not been there, we would be talking about Alexis Arguello as, you know, a top five pound-for-pound -pound fighter. Alexis Arguello was this gentle, this tall, this statuesque, he was good-looking, he had a great jab, he was a terrific fighter. Aaron Pryor, on the other hand, was a street urchin from Cincinnati, and he was just one tough little SOB. How did Aaron Pryor walk through those right hands? Because Arguello was hitting him with punches, with right hands that weren't just hitting him. You ever hear a trainer say, punch through the target? 
He was punching through Fryer's face. You thought you knew more about Oguayo. He had that classical straight up a little bit, which could hurt him a little bit because you could find him a little bit. But people loved that classical sound. They, they felt comfortable with it. I don't know if he'll be on time. That's kind of how you felt about Brian. I don't know if he's going to be on time. I don't know if I can rely on him. He's not something that we feel secure about. We kept waiting for him not to be reliable. We kept waiting for Aguayo to put the lights out on his party. So, bing, catch him with the right hand and, and say, OK, see, we told you. And it never happened. Pryor, a two-to-one underdog, dashed Arguello's dreams with a 14th round knockout. Eight, 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 eight. It's rare to have two undefeated, undisputed heavyweight champions. On March 8, 1971, in Madison Square Garden, in what was billed as the fight of the century, Muhammad Ali sought to reclaim the heavyweight championship that had been stripped from him for refusing military induction. The title was held by the redoubtable Joe Frazier. Thus began an epic rivalry. The first Ali Frazier fight in 1971 was the biggest sports spectacle since the second Tunney Dempsey fight 44 years earlier. Frazier was fast and hard and relentless. And Ali was still uh, a beautiful fighter to watch, but was a little bigger, a little heavier, not quite as elusive. And it was just enough that Frazier could get on him and stay on him. Ali looked at Frazier as the sellout. Guy had sold out to the white establishment. For him to be viewed as a white, sucking Uncle Tom kind of guy was the greatest insult you could give a guy who was nothing but raging black. The young Muhammad Ali would have run circles around Joe Frazier, but it wasn't the young Ali who got in the ring with Joe. My kid blew the 11th round big. I don't know how the heck he stayed erect. He looked like a ballet dancer, like a pirouette. He didn't feel that he was fighting only for himself. He felt that he was fighting for everybody who believed in him. I remember listening on the radio as a, as a young kid. I'm thinking, what? You down? It was one of those nights that I will always remember. And when Ali went down, it was, it was as if I and, and my generation had taken a punch to the solar plexus. Ali got up at the count of four in the 15th round, but Frazier had won the unanimous decision. Don't flinch, don't move. On September 27, 1946, in Yankee Stadium, one of the most ferocious rivalries in sports began. Rocky Graziano, the 11-5 hometown favorite, faced off against Tony Zale, who had won the middleweight title in 1941. Both were tougher than gristle. You had a guy from Gary, Indiana, Tony Zale, who they called the man of steel, and he was. You know, Graziano was the younger fighter, the guy coming up. Graziano's the Italian guy from New York. I mean, there were just a ton of... of things that um, fit that sort of time and place in, the, in America. These two clashed, and it was like a, it was like a neighborhood fist fight on the corner. You had an irresistible force against an immovable object. They both went down. When Zale knocked him down, he, Rocky got up and knocked Zale down. Boom, boom, back, back and forth. Was, somebody was going to go. An almost inhuman amount of punishment was dished out to one fighter or the other. After the second round, Ray Arcel and the handlers of Zale had to go out and pull him back to his corner. He was in bad shape. At the end of the fifth round, when Zale came back to his corner, his legs were quivering. It was a, it was a miracle almost that they could get him onto his feet again at the end of a minute. It's just a matter of time before Rocky Graziano knocks out Zale and wins the middleweight title. In the sixth round, Rocky got hit with a left hook to the body that the solar plexus and it paralyzed him and he went down. By the time he got up, it was after 10. It just completely knocked all the wind out. He went home after that fight and he was in seclusion for weeks. Zale's finishing punch was thrown with a broken thumb. Their six rounds left everyone wanting more. They would get it. On July 16, 1947, in Chicago, Zale and Graziano resumed their brutal rivalry. This one, like the first, ended in the sixth round. Unlike the first, this one had a different winner. The second fight, they knew what it was, which was a whole night of hell. And they willingly uh, 
chose to go there. Two human beings who were totally committed to annihilate the opposition. Dale drives a right to the body, a right to the jaw, putting Graziano on the ropes again. Dale Graziano too was actually very similar to the first fight, but role reversals. It's Rocky Graziano who's getting the tar beaten out of him. One eye is shut, the other is bleeding. Zale actually controlled the early going. Graziano standing up now, straight, bobs and waves a little bit. To keep the fight from being stopped, his trainer, Whitey Bemstein, pressed a quarter to the eye and caused the swelling to leak out. He came out with murderous, one good eye, and climbed all over Zale on the ropes, pounding him. Graziano unleashed a fury of rights, knocking Zale down. More right hands drove Zale to the ropes, and the referee stopped him. Rocky Graziano, he's got like fire in his eyes. Like I said, it's like, ah. And the referee said I had to stop Rocky that night because he would have killed Tony Zell. Rocky Graziano was the new middleweight champion of the world. Five, five, five. Never bet against U.S. Steel, General Motors, and Joe Lewis. Billy Kahn, a light heavyweight, tried to cash that bet on June 18, 1941, before 60,000 in the polo grounds. After 12 rounds, he looked like a winner, and the four-year reign of Joe Lewis was in dire jeopardy. Billy Kahn was a very, very good fighter, a very tough kid from Pittsburgh. He hit Lewis with a right hand that made Lewis' legs turn into spaghetti. Billy Kahn got cocky, and instead of going for the decision, he tried to knock Joe Lewis out. He began to try to slug with Joe Lewis, and that was the mistake. Lewis is losing the fight, 7-4-1 on, on most scorecards, nails him in the middle of the ring, and then puts together that classic Joe Lewis combination, head, body, uppercut. And Khan is out. And Lewis came right back from the brink of defeat after Khan had made as great a fight as you could possibly imagine. Only two seconds remained in the 13th round when Khan was counted out. I guess I had too much to win for tonight, and I tried to knock him out. Otherwise, I'd have won easy. It being number Thomas Hearns was called the hitman for obvious and violent reasons. Marvelous Marvin Hagler possessed wrecking ball fists, too. On April 15, 1985, in Las Vegas, in an unbridled slugfest, the two middleweights squared off for three furious rounds that seemed like 15. When the bell rang, the man across me were like two vicious amateurs just slugging away. They didn't care. Caution to them. These guys delivered in a way that you seldom see. In any, in the 15th round of a fight, let alone in the first round of a fight, when guys feel each other out. Sometimes it happens that an athlete shows up the night of a performance, and he simply ain't got it. And that's what happened to Tommy Hearns. What I noticed through the end of the second round was that Tommy Hearns had no legs. That fight could not have went the distance at that pace. You can't do that. Tommy Hearns, he went in there that night with Marvin Hagler, who only had not been knocked down once. Tommy Hearns threw that right hand, and bam, right off the chin of Hagler. Hagler took a step back and kept coming forward. Both guys never let up. They just kept willing away. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, hard, vicious shots. No one threw a jab. No one set the man up. No one had a proper stance. They were, it was a street fight. I don't think that either one of us really thought. We just fought. I was in a brawl, and we both was, and we both was giving it to each other. The punch that really did Tommy Hearns in was a kind of a right jab, because Marvin had a southpaw. Hearns went down in the third round, arose, but was unable to continue. Hagler had never quite gotten his due as a great champion. And I think with that knockout, people realized this is not just a middleweight champ. This is an all-time great. Three, three, three. Once the Archie Moore fight with Darrell took place, everybody understood now a fight is not over until it's over. On December 10th, 1958, Archie Moore, the 40-something light heavyweight champ, was sent to the canvas four times by three-to-one underdog Yvonne Durrell. Somehow, the old mongoose kept getting up. For some reason, uh, Archie Moore in that fight was wide open. And, uh, Yvonne Durrell wasn't a great fighter, but... 
He just clobbered him all over the place. It was cold inside the arena, and it, Archie got a slow start in the fight, and Darrell caught him right away and, and knocked him down. Archie shouldn't have got up, but his courage got him up. Up that nine, but staggering. He got knocked out three times in the first round. As Archie put it, it felt like my head exploded. Sounds strange, but one of Darrell's punches, like, woke up more. Wait a minute, he went down all those times, but he's up. And he's not only up, he's throwing the leather in. Whoa, Darrell's down. Ten seconds left. Down goes Darrell. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Saved by the bell at the count of eight. If you were like a student of manly art of self-defense you don't slap that tape on and show your students like this is how you want to box you know but if you want to raise a family of fighters you know you put it on and you say this is what fighters do they get knocked down they get up and then, then they knock you down and then the guy he gets up and he comes with bad intentions that's what a fighter is more put Darrell down for good in the 11. eight struggling at nine then he is out man oh man what a dramatic Two, two, two. two fighters who were dominant fighters, if they decline at a similar pace, make a great fight. On October 1st, 1975, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier completed their three-part 41-round effort. This one, overlaid with undisguised hatred, lasted 14 savage rounds. Frazier and Ali meet in Manila in 1975. Ali has given all of himself the year before in Zaire. Frazier was really perceived as a shot fighter. He was done. Muhammad Ali's idea going into that fight is that Frazier's a slow starter. Let me jump right on him and get him out early. Thriller Manila was a, a, a tremendous fight. It, well, let's not call it a fight. Let's call it a war. They were fighting for the heavyweight championship of each other. The first part, Ali is just whipping on Frazier. Somehow, in the middle rounds, Frazier comes through. Frazier starts wailing, he cuts off the ring, he gets him on the ropes. He was killing Ali. Ali tried to regain the psychological edge by looking at him and saying, Joe Frazier, they told me you were washed up. And Frazier said, they told you wrong, pretty boy. There was a real sense by the end of the 10th round, Frazier is going to beat Ali. Closest to life and death I've ever seen. To equally match fighters. An intense competitive edge on each other, if not dislike, actual hatred, if you will. I never saw Joe Frazier take so many punches. Ali got tired of hitting him. It looked like Ali was going to have to quit in the corner. He said, I feel like I'm dying. This must be what death feels like. At the bell ending the 14th, Ali knocked out Frazier's mouthpiece. Frazier's eyes were almost completely shut. Joe came back to the corner, and I said, I said, it's all over, Joe. I said, I can use your lies. Don't worry about it. He said, no. So I said, OK. Shut it down. It's all over. It's a tribute to both fighters that they put themselves through that. When two old warriors are going at it, there's more damage being inflicted. And they inflicted a lot of damage on each other that night. In sports, the most Welcome back to Who's Number One and the 20 Greatest Fights of All Time. Let's recap them. 20. Gene Tunney, Jack Dempsey, The Long Count. 19. Sugar Ray Robinson, Jake LaMotta, number six. 18. Muhammad Ali, George Foreman, Rumble in the Jungle. 17. Joe Lewis, Max Schmeling, More Than a Fight. 16. Willie Pep, Sandy Sadler, number two of four. 15. Evander Holyfield, Riddick Bowe, Battle of the Unbeatens. 14. Sugar Ray Leonard, Thomas Hearns, Big Rally. 13. Rocky Marciano, Jersey Joe Walker, One Big Punch. 12. Larry Holmes, Ken Norton, Iowa. 11. George Foreman, Ron Lyle, Timber. 10. Carmen Basilio, Tony DeMarco, Concrete Chin. Nine. Alexis Arguello, Aaron Pryor, no fourth title. Eight. Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, the trilogy begins. Seven. 
Seven. Tony Zale, Rocky Graziano, one. Six. Tony Zale, Rocky Graziano, two. Five. Joe Lewis, Billy Kahn, the almost upset. Four. Marvin Hagler, Thomas Hearns, three rounds of hell. Three. Archie Moore, Yvonne Durrell, keep getting up. Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier. The trilogy ends. Well, there's the bell, and the judges have made their decision. Here's number one. 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 On September 14, 1923, in the polo grounds, Jack Dempsey found himself on one knee before the echo of the first bell faded. The heavyweight champ was knocked down by Louis Furpo. Dempsey responded by decking the Argentine challenger seven times. Furpo responded by knocking Dempsey out of the ring. This was the stuff of legend, the million dollar game. Back when a million dollars was a million dollars. Dempsey was at the height of his powers at that point, and, and you know, Furpo was the wild bull of the Pampas, and, uh, you know, people had sort of heard of him, but you didn't, who's gonna, who's gonna knock down Jack Dempsey? Furpo was 220 pounds back then, that was considered a giant. Dempsey's about 190 pounds. In its day, it was probably the most dramatic fight, considering the scale and, you know, what was on the line, and then the actual action and ships of momentum and controversy. Furpo got up, he's a very clumsy ox of a man. Like this, like a washerwoman. Dempsey was baiting them up, but then Furpo landed a punch and knocked Dempsey right through the ropes. Now the champion is in desperate trouble. See Dempsey outside the ring, being helped back in the ring, pushed back in by the spot riders. He always gave them credit, actually, for saving him in the fight. There was great courage. You know, you get knocked through the ropes, it's pretty easy to say, well, not my night. Tremendous fight, and that made Dempsey a boxing immortal. Dempsey registered two more knockdowns in the second, the last one ending the fight. The final tally, 11 knockdowns in less than four minutes. And Jack Dempsey, of course, became an icon, how the word we use, is an iconic figure, he became an icon of what was then part of the jazz age. Ultimately, what made it, makes it a great fight is that the right guy won, by which I mean Dempsey proved his greatness. I'm still Jack Dempsey, and you're not. Heavy hands, quick feet, the heart of a lion. That makes for a great fighter and a great fight. And also leads to what else? Great debate. Which leads us, naturally, to our second guessers. Brawlin' Burt Randolph Sugar and nasty Nick Acachella and their opinion of the list. Gentlemen, be kind. Nick, what about this list? Now, I must, a uh, little bit of confession here and a little bit of just saying I was part of the panel that pulled this together. What do you think about it? Dempsey I, I Furpo, have, number one. I have one. no problem with Dempsey Furpo being number one. I got a problem with a couple of these being way down on the list. Uh, the 1951 Willie Pep Sandy Sadler fight should be much higher. And that than was their second is. fight. The second fight. And I think the uh, Hearns Hagler probably is number two. That was a brilliant... I mean, yeah. and, and people will remember that because... Sure. I mean, do you remember Richard Steele stopping the fight while mm -hmm. Hagler had the cut here and so said... There was blood he, running down Can you face. see? Yeah, and right, he, said, right. and he right. said, I'm hitting him. He said, I'm hitting him, ain't I? And came right back and pounded him. So if I break up, hypothetically, uh, Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, one, and Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, three... Yeah, well, number three is the better fight, but number one certainly belongs on well, the list. Well, how the trappings? Yeah. I mean, you should have seen the outfits that night. Floor, length, fur, coat, sable. Why matching white hats, white sable. Mm -hmm. Those were the men. Those were the men. <laughs> the women were in hot pants. It was look for... But why that was important was because of what it meant at that time in the Vietnamese conflict. Right. right. The anti- and pro-war. Fraser became the darling of the hard hats. The same Ali. reason the Schmeling, the Schmeling Lewis fight is on here for its historical content. Yeah, two minutes and four seconds does not make a great why fight. Why not? A superior athlete defeating... Um, an athlete who's not as good very, very quickly. I have no problem with that. It was always a question with the panel whether the third Ali Fraser fight was better. Forget the trappings as a fight. <clears throat> Remember, that's the one where Ali said it was the closest thing to death. Yeah, closest thing to death. I, mean, you've got, I think you've got them listed right. I think three is the, is, is the fight. But some of the, some of the older fights, I, I have a problem with, with Willie Pep, Sandy Sadler, Being 1951. Too low. Way too low. I mean, this was, this was brilliant. I mean, Pep was battered. 
battered and won the fight. I mean, he was bleeding. No, he, he was, was like, but he was doing everything he, he was could. Doing everything he you could. know what he said in, after that fight? He tried everything he could with Sadler, and he couldn't keep him off him except one thing. When he stepped on his foot, he stepped on his foot. Right. He said, right, "Ouch!" Right, right. He said, "I stepped so on his foot." He kept stepping on his foot. Fifteen right. rounds because uh -huh. he had corns. Uh -huh. I mean, that was, I mean, that was a classic a matchup of a brilliant, brilliant boxer and a hitter. And how about some of the today's fights? I mean, you know, do you, what do you think of Ali Foreman? Ali Foreman... I, I mean, know. that was a contention. Yeah. I mean, well, how high it goes, is it a great fight or just a great moment? How do you distinguish a great moment from a great fight? Is, isn't a great fight because of great moments or maybe even one great moment makes a great fight? Possibly, and maybe it transcends the moment, though, and lives forever beyond that as a total fight. I mean, go ahead and tell me one moment of Sadler Pep. Uh, no, 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 no. See, that, no, no, to no, me, no, that no. was a totality. No, no, that's, that's a totality. That's a totality. That was a white, like, like Graziano Zale. I just think that the, uh, the Hagler Hearns fight might have been one of the great moments we remember. Yeah. Uh, any others? Uh, no, Lyle? There's, there's something missing here, I, 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 I see. The, um, the Jack Johnson. Uh, um, Jess Willard Jess Willard. Willard. The Jack Johnson, Jess Willard fight. I mean, obviously, even you and I weren't old enough to see that. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we could be sitting but up. At least for historical significance. All right, okay. we've got an almost concurrence, okay. and in conclusion, we have an almost concurrence. Well, the second guessers have had their say. Now it's time to see how you, the fan, voted on Sports Nation on ESPN.com for the greatest fight of all time. Number five, Sugar Ray Leonard, Tommy Hearns won. Muhammad Ali, George Foreman. Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier won. Marvin Hagler, Tommy Hearns. Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier three. And that's it for this edition of Who's Number One, a bleeding battering version. Thanks for joining us for ESPN Classics ranking of the 20 greatest fights of all time. We will be back to continue our countdown of the teams, the athletes, and the events that have shaped our world in sports. Until then, let the debating begin.